Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our International Ground Round Association at Susano. Today, I'm very pleased to have uh, one of my colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Cristobal Langdon. Good morning, Cristobal. Good morning, Puya. How are you doing? So Cristobal and I went uh, for a while part of the ERS uh, junior members, uh, um, and uh, we were um, part of the faculty of the ERS junior members. We got to each other and I'm very proud and uh, happy to have him as a speaker, plenary speaker today. Cristobal is a part of uh, the team of Isam Malavid from the University of Barcelona and the hospital in Barcelona. And he, I was fascinated by their technique and nuances for repairing septal perforation, which is a uh, which is a very frustrating, frustrating, uh, you know, happening for the patients, and it's very tough to deal with those things. So I requested Cristobal to talk about this, and he accepted, and I'm very proud of this. He will start to presenting um, some slides and videos, I guess, and uh, you will get some nuances from him and his team. Do remind that all the questions should be asked at the end. You can type your question below and from the social media, and all the questions should be replied at the end of his talk. Thank you, Cristobal. Please share your screen. You're welcome. Okay. So good. Good afternoon, everybody. So. Okay. So first of all, thanks, Puya, for this invitation. It's an honor to me to present our work in in your organization. It's very interesting what you have been doing uh, till now and uh, very interesting talks. So uh, as you asked me, is is to present how, how we do and how we repair septal perforation uh, here at, at our organization. So, so now, first thing, uh, I really hate this kind of recipe. I do it like this and blah, 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 blah. I'm just giving techniques it's the way we do it it's not the only way of course and please uh, try to take only the good things that i'm doing to in order to improve your yourself so of course yeah, when you when you approach a, a patient with a nasal perforation you have to do a very thorough clinical assessment you have to ask for past medical history nasal surgeries and um, immune diseases drug abuse then then we do an, an endoscopy we do not always biopsy uh, perforation long time ago uh, it was said that you have to biopsy all and uh, nasal perforation in order to discard a uh, neoplasm or other things but uh, up today we 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 rarely rarely do a biopsy of the nasal perforation then of course we do a ct scan the ct scan we will explain later why and let me just focus on one thing about drug abuse, because for us it's very important. And, and when when you have you have done a couple of them, you have referring patients, and most of the patient consume and abuse of drugs. And this is a patient that has a coke abuse. Just I only want to repeat and just to focus on that cobblestone mucosa with pus. Uh, that's the middle meatus. Just can you see my my arrow? This cobblestone mucosa. Yes. Please, please remember this image. Sorry. Here another one. This is pretty obvious, but please focus on this cobblestone mucosa here. It's really a, a very pathognomonic image of drug abuse. So you really, really, really need to ask one, two, three, ten, hundred times about drug consuming. Because if you go to surgery and the patient's still consuming, of course, it would be a failure. So uh, you have to be like house. Always, always do not trust on this kind of patient. And uh, not all these um, strange looking or active nasal perforation are autoimmune diseases. And you always have to look and really, really uh, go behind the drug abuse. So back in, back in the game, uh, this is how we do an endoscopy. We really assess for the osteocartilaginous support. This is a really pretty straightforward nasal perforation, really nice. Uh, uh, this was because of nasal uh, picking. So it's a very clean nasal perforation. Of course, the patient has symptoms. Um, 
unwanted uh, solutions. So we really are measuring the nasal perforation is pretty nice mucosa. We are touching the osteocartilaginous support because we base all our treatment on this support. In, in the box, you have a wide variety of options. Uh, usually the, the, the choose of the surgery is regarding to, to, the, to the size of the perforation. Nowadays, we really, it's not that we don't uh, focus on this, but we mainly focus on the osteocartilaginous support. So just, I will do a, a, a review of what we do. So you have nasal perforation with osteocartilaginous support. And this is very important because it will really ease your surgery in order to raise your flap pretty straightforward, pretty easy, would be very uh, straightforward surgery. In the other case where you don't have osteocartilaginous support, of course, it would, if you have remaining mucosa, it would be really difficult to raise an, a, a flap from the septum. And if you are raising a flap from the lateral nasal wall, you won't have any structure to uh, secure the flap in, in the nasal septum. So this is our uh, flow chart. And this nowadays is resumed with this. Regarding of the size, nowadays we are closing almost up to three, 3.5 centimeters with the anterior moidal artery flap. This is if we have osteocartilaginous support. If we don't have osteocartilaginous support, it would be a more tricky, but mainly we are using inferior meatus flap, posterior pedicle, inferior turbinate flap, or lateral wall flap. We'll, we'll show it in a minute. And if it's really big, we are using pericranial flap or a very wide posterior lateral nasal flap. So it's all about the flap in nasal perforation. So in order to understand the flap, you really need to be, have a keen anatomy on the nasal uh, uh, arteries. So as you all know, you have arterial and anterior, anterior moil artery that runs in the lateral nasal wall through here and in the septum at this point. Then you have the posterior lateral and the posterior moidal artery, again, goes to the lateral wall and to the septum. Then you have the sp sphenopalatine with all these arteries, uh, the posterior nasal artery to the septum, the ones that nourish the nasal septal flap. Then you have the posterior lateral nasal artery that nourish all the lateral nasal wall at the level of the inferior turbinate of the nasal flow. Then you have the greater palatine artery that runs through the palatines and comes again to outside in the nose at the level of the incisive canal. And a uh, friend, a colleague of us in, in Madrid uh, present um, a flap based on this artery. And then you have the tiny artery from the labial, uh, labial artery. Sorry, and sorry, okay. The zoom, okay and the uh, superior labial artery and the uh, lateral nasal arteries. Okay, so if you have all these arteries in mind, you will be able to tailor the flaps to reconstruct uh, your nasal perforation. Oops, okay. So first, this is our workhorse regarding um, septal perforation uh, and anterior moidal artery flap that was described by, by Professor Castelnovo and his team. It's a really nice flap. And then uh, colleagues from, from Barcelona here described that uh, although it's mainly vascularized from the anterior moid artery, if you have, if you tailor a, a bigger pedicle, you have branches from the posterior nasal, posterior moidal artery as well. So the flap is pretty straightforward. The, the pedicle, if, if you have to put it really easily, is at the level at, at the level of the septum, but at the level of the insertion of the middle turbinate and in between the insertion of the middle turbinate and the insertion of superior turbinate. If you respect and keep this as your pedicle, you, you will be safe. You will have one, two, three arteries there, and you will have a really, really nice flap. The flap can go all the way up to the, to the, to the floor and can be extended all the way 
to the inferior meatus. We have extended the flap all the way to the inferior meatus and still a little bit of the, lat of the lateral nasal wall in order to have a, a wider, a bigger flap for three, 3.5 centimeters. Again, you can extend the posterior incision all the way up to the rostrum in order to have a bigger flap. By doing this, you will have a couple of square centimeters that will help you when you, know that when you move your flap anteriorly, if you have a perforation here, you will be able to close your last five to eight millimeters at the, at, the, at the posterior part of the perforation. So that's a, a really nice trick to, to do. This again, this is the flap. This is for you to understand what, what is the movement of this flap. So just one trick here. Um, you really, really, really need to dissect the flap all the way to the skull base, it, you know, mostly at the, at the posterior incision, because if you do not do that, the flap won't uh, move anteriorly and it would be really, really difficult to manage and reconstruct your perforation. So don't be afraid and um, go all the way up, up to the skull base with your dissection. Of course, you have to be very careful, but and really, really secure and be sure that you have cut all this incision because if not, the flap won't move and it would be really difficult for you to uh, reconstruct and do the, the stitches in the anterior and superior part. <clears throat> then, if um, we don't have a septum uh, available for reconstruction, we developed this uh, modified nasal floor and inferior meatus flap. The idea is to use all the nasal floor and the inferior meatus like this in order to, sorry, reconstruct mostly inferior perforation. Again, you can reconstruct mostly up to three centimeters, but it has to be really low because if not, the, 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 the nasal flow is, is not that wide to have a, a, a higher, to reconstruct a higher nasal perforation. This flap is mainly nourished from the uh, greater palatine artery here. So you really, really need to preserve it from both sides. And, and if you're doing a nasal perforation after septoplasty, you really need to be sure that that artery wasn't cauterized or cut during the septoplasty. If not, the flap will die. So again, the idea, I continue, is you raise your flap and then turn to the other side and you do your stitches and this is done. Here is a video. This is a patient with a, a really low nasal perforation. Um, he was a nasal polyp patient. I think this was his fifth or seventh surgery. And when we are doing the nasal polyp surgery, the functional nasal surgery, we decide to, to close the, the nasal perforation. This is how we are preparing the flap. The posterior cut is at the level, at the end of the heart palate, and you can bring your incision through the lateral nasal wall inferior meatus all the way anteriorly up to the mucocutaneous junction. We usually do the incision with a bobby or monopolar cautery. Uh, I know that a Professor Carcelnovo do it with a beaver knife. I really love that technique, but we don't have beaver knives here in our hospital. I tried to ask for, but I had no answer. But anyway, we don't have any problem doing with um, a monopolar cautery, so. So again, that's, that's the end of the heart palate. You read, so here you see, we preserve the great palatine artery. This is because we had the, I would put, this is, we had because of the nasal polyp surgery, we have the, the debrider. So I trim the border of the mucosa with the debrider. We, we, we don't use in every case this. 
this is another thing important. You really need to at least rim at least five millimeters. Nowadays, I'm doing almost up to one centimeters in order to uh, uh, put your flap in contact with the uh, cartilage or the bone or the other side of the uh, mucosa of the, the periosteum, perichondrium or periosteum mucosa in order to have uh, to, to uh, white surface contacting together and securing the uh, healing process. So this is how we finish. We put one stitch here, another here, another on behind. This is one month post op. And you can see really nice healing and closure of all the nasal perforation. We we actually were talking before before the the meeting starts with Cristobal, and I was uh, requesting and tell him you know I'm struggling with the suturing, so I will please. Uh, let us know how you deal with the with the suture. This is a this is the, the next one. This yes, is this is the next one. So, uh, if we don't have uh, osteocartilaginous support uh, nowadays, it's really rare cases with big perforation. So we are doing posterior lateral nasal wall flap. Uh, this is a two stage surgery. One to raise the flap and secure the, and, and reconstruct the perforation. And the second one to detach and cut the pedicle from the lateral nasal wall in order to reconstruct the posterior part. So in here, you all know the posterior lateral nasal wall flap is a really wide and big flap. And again, sorry, you can do it pedicle anteriorly based on the anterior medial artery or posteriorly based on the posterior lateral nasal artery. Again, here, this is our, uh, in our uh, lab, this is how you see the posterior lateral nasal artery, it's really, really nice artery, and it gives two branches, one that goes superior and medially, and then uh, and the other one goes uh, lateral and inferiorly in the um, inferior turbinate. So, as you see, it's a really, really big flap, and this is how we do it in real life. This is uh, almost three point uh, three centimeters in length and in height, uh, twenty-two millimeters. Really big perforation after septoplasty. Here, the, the CT scan is where you have the nasal pattern in, in inside, and you can see a really big perforation. So you can see here, we don't have any support. This is the perforation, but here, one centimeter behind, you will start having some support. Really, this is a disaster and really difficult to, to reconstruct. So in this case, we decide to do a lateral nasal wall flap in order to reconstruct this perforation. So because it's based anteriorly, we, uh, sorry, posteriorly, we start the, our incision anterior at the level of the insertion of the middle turbinate, just anterior to the uncinate process, in a, running down through the maxillary line and coming anteriorly all the way following the piriform aperture. Then the inferior cut is at the level of the nasal floor. And this flap is really difficult to raise because you really need to uh, dissect completely the inferior turbinate uh, in, in both surface and to, in order to remove the whole bone and have a really only mucosa to flatten it and then put it to the other side of the nose in order to reconstruct. So.
we are good in time now, Puya. You have the time, don't worry. You okay, perfect. So, well. If I'm going too fast, please tell me. So here we are dissecting at the level of the piriform aperture. I really like to, to do my surgeries on forehand, on freehand technique, because I, for me it's easier to control and have a, very, a, a better a dissection and, and a cleaner surgery. For those that are starting, I always like to stress that the camera uh, has to our your operation field has to be in the middle of the of the of the screen. If you are not a, a, able to do that, you you won't do a good surgery. So just to stress that that idea for the ones that are starting, because for me it's really important and ease your your surgery as well. So this is the piriform aperture, and then we we'll start dissecting the inferior turbinate posteriorly. So basically, right now you elevated one part, I guess the left part of the of the nostril, right? Exactly. The left, the left, the left lateral nasal wall. All right. And so here is so this, this is, is the this is where the cotylus is the so-called shoulder of the inferior turbinate. And here we are starting to dissect the turbinate bone. Okay. So this could be something like the flap that you would like to raise if you want to do um, uh, a pre-lacrimal approach for the for the uh, middle meatus, right? Um, more or less, yes. Okay. So right now we are dissecting here. Then now we are dissecting inferior meatus, and we will isolate the uh, nasal lacrimal duct, okay? I will show you in a minute. Here we are posteriorly. This is the, the nasal lacrimal duct. Here we finish it to remove the bone of the inferior turbinate at the posterior part. You really need to remove whole bone because if not, you will have a lot of crusting afterwards. If you leave the, the, uh, the bone, uh, without any mucosa. Uh, the, the posterior part is the tricky part because you will have the pedicle. Here is the nasal lacrimal duct. We, we cut it with blunt uh, instrument. Okay, then of course, I always put a stitch, vicryl stitch, because if not, you will have a hole in your, very tiny hole, but anyway, I put a stitch there in order to uh, erase the, to close the, the, the nasal lacrimal opening. So here, now we are putting, we always put the first stitch anteriorly and superiorly. And I will show you this, for me, this is the trick. This not, I will show you again in a couple of, in a minute, how we do it because that is the running knot. With that, you don't have to, you just pull your, your knot and it, the knot will go all the way inside. So here, this is the running knot. For me, this is the knot that is crucial for closing or for doing knot inside the nose. Because the, 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 the difficult part is to, 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 to make the knot, not to pass the needle in the mucosa. So by doing this, you see, and then I pull from one side and goes all the way inside and you cut and that's it. You that's have, brilliant. okay? So I think if, because this will be recorded, you, you just look it again and you will try to uh, do it. If not, you can contact me, no problem. So, but what if, if we don't have anything inside the nose to, uh, to reconstruct? So uh, here we develop, we have this idea uh, based on our skull-based experience. Uh, sorry, just to stress that mostly 
a lot of people say if you don't have septum, you won't have symptoms, but that not, is not completely true. There are some patients that without septum, because whatever, uh, they, they develop this really, really problematic crusting that really uh, affect his quality of life. So based on our skull-based experience using the pericranial flap, okay, this is just to show the pericranial flap, we say, okay, if we, we can use it to the skull base, why we can we cannot use it to reconstruct the septum? So if we, we are putting forward towards the skull base, why not to put it anteriorly towards the septum and reconstruct the septum? So this is the idea. Using a coronal incision, we raise a flap. We always do both sides uh, to have a, a thicker flap. We uh, fold the flap. This part goes here and we do some stitches. And so we fold the flap and then through a nasal a frontal osteotomy and a draft strip procedure, we push the flap inside the nose and we secure it to the remaining structure inside the nose. So this is what we are still developing this technique is we have done five patients and we are still improving in every case our technique. So this is the, the patient really, really big nasal perforation, tiny Rembrandt here at the, at the Edmoid plate and Bomber behind. So we start preparing the nasal cavity. Uh, this is the sphenoid, the rostrum, and we're putting the flap inside this pocket in order to ease the epitalization. So this is how we do that. This is pretty straightforward graft free procedure. Uh, for those who do who do, who do, who do uh, tumor surgery is pretty straightforward to, to erase uh, to raise a pericranial flap. Remember that this flap is nourished by the uh, supratrochlear and supraorbital arteries, so you have to respect uh, those arteries. So, okay. so we'll go a little bit faster. You elevate your flap. Okay. This is the flap. Sorry. Then through transillumination, you draw where is your frontal sinus and there you do your frontal osteotomy. Nowadays, we are trying to do like three centimeter, four centimeter in width and in, in height, like one and a half more or less centimeters. Uh, the last case we use the piezo. It's really nice. We create like a, a door, uh, and then we, re, we 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 put again. We close the 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 frontal osteotomy with the same bone. This is how we we fold the flap. We use bicryl for for O bicryl to to secure both side of the flap. Once we have it, we complete the frontal osteotomy and one, one team in the nose, the other team on the head. And we pass the flap. Here we, we are working here and we pass the flap inside the nose. So we use guiding sutures, one for, for the anterior part and one for the posterior part. 
because if not, the flap is really, really big. If you, you put the flap inside the nose, you won't find which one is the anterior part or the posterior part. So that's uh, one trick to remember. How much time does it require usually? Um, the first surgery was like 10 hour surgery, <laughs> the first one. And nowadays, uh, the last case was six, six hours, more or less. All these cases are with uh, rhinoplasty, so that adds two more hours to your surgery. Yeah. Uh, now, that is, we're doing this around six hours, more or less. Okay. So this is two weeks post-op. Is a Rembrandt of Spongostan, four week post op. Now the flap is tightening, and you see that it has like some elastic tension here. It's, now it's more like an nasal septum. three months and you can see it's difficult to say if this is the real septum or a pericranial flap septum. Now here is we are doing it with a narrow band imaging just to see the vascularization the neovascularization of the flap you can see nice to see all the the arterioles and uh, in the flap. So this is a one year post-op CT scan, complete nasal reconstruction, both frontal sinus clean, and it's a really nice result. Uh, sorry, just just a minute. Of, of course, this is was the perfect case. It's pretty amazing, but uh, we we. Nowadays, uh, we don't have, we, we have patients that we lost the flap. So we have again, like we only remain in a 40% of the flap. So it's not a good result. Um, other case, we have uh, almost 90% of reconstruction, just a little part in the anterior superior. We have a reperforation, but the patient has no symptoms. So that's a good result as well. Uh, but we're still refining this technique. It's a pretty new technique. It's a really long hour of surgery. And, uh, but we think that will be a, a nice solution for this uh, complex uh, patient with a big nasal perforation, symptomatic big nasal perforation. Uh, just finishing, I invite you to uh, review this book. This is Professor Lovitan Castelnovo Endoscopic Technique for nasal perforation, really, really nice a book with really nice drawing and very pretty straightforward explanation to, for you to become a master in, in nasal perforation uh, repairing. And I, I will uh, use this platform to announce our course, the second course of nasal, nasal septal perforation in November. Hopefully we can do it. We're still uh, doing uh, arrangement to uh, continue with the course. Uh, we will announce you sooner if, if we can do it uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Puya for this opportunity. And now I'm open for questions or comments or whatever you, you want. Thank you. Thank you, Cristobal. So amazing uh, results. Uh, very proud of those. Uh, and I really like the pericranial flap. Uh, I was reading about that. So amazing artwork. Of course, uh, we of course we have to take in consideration that uh, those huge holes are in need 
for such a treatment. However, sometimes we have to deal with such a long period of surgery. So, you know, if we if we go in from uh, 10 hours, then go six hours, this is a pretty amazing deal with. This is an improvement. This have to improve. We just need times. So I really admire pioneering everything. So, um, of course, you did a great job. And uh, for those who's interested, of course, uh, there's a YouTube channel developed from uh, Cristobal. You can go there and watch all his uh, um, technical nuances and uh, and uh, scenarios. Uh, we always support educational material. So it's fundamental. It's not advertising. It's a, it's a mandatory to watch. Uh, there's a few questions from the audience. Um, let's start uh, from, from, from here. The first uh, from fellow, they say, does frontal sinus didn't give you any problem after the surgery? No, as I show you in the CT scan, it's completely clean. In, in none of the the, the cases we have done, we have any problem with the frontal sinus. Of course, you have to really do a really big graft free procedure. Another question from Juan Carlos. He say, in your experience, what signs or symptoms are decisive for you to indicate surgery? Um, if the patient complains, I offer surgery. Um, usually, pa these patients come with nasal crossing, um, if, if they only have nasal obstruction or nasal, like they don't feel that they are breathing through the nose, I tend not to do surgery because there's a lot of more physiopathological uh, things going in inside the, that nose. Uh, but mainly, yes, nasal crusting, nasal bleeding, crusting, bleeding. Yeah, that's those. I think that's what those two are the, the main symptoms. Another question from uh, Juan Maza Solano. He said, what is your experience with silicone septal buttons compared to flaps? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Juan. How are you doing? Uh, we don't use nasal buttons at all. Uh, we, we always try to close the nasal perforation. Um, so we, we, I don't have any experience. I have experience removing nasal buttons, but not putting nasal buttons. <laughs> There's something. So, uh, the uh, Edir Shitai say, do you put transeptal sutures in the periosteum flaps to avoid hematoma or putting the splints for two, three weeks is enough? Yes, we, on, we only put splints in, in, in every case. In every case, we put a silicon sheet splints for two, three. In nasal pickers, we leave the splints until the patient complains <laughs> because we have a, not a lot, but a couple of patients that after three months or six months, they return again with a perforation. So the, the median length for nasal picking is two months, more or less. And for the other ones are three weeks four weeks, depending. Yeah. So you, San Lin, said just perform anterior uh, ethmoidal artery based flap repair. And today he was so happy with this. Compliment for you. So we go ahead. And then we have uh, Marina Butkovaya say, do you have an age limit for this operation? Uh, no. Uh, if the patient has symptoms, uh, bad, bad quality of life, and of course, if it doesn't have any other health issues that won't be able to put the patient in the operation theater. We don't have age limit. Alberto Guzman is saying, is it always possible to fix septal perforations? So before you reply, I think that we have to avoid saying always. We are talking about medicine. Always is not always. It depends. So please go ahead with your reply. So the, the question is, it is, it is always... It is always possible to fix the septal perforations? No, of course not. Uh, it's not always possible. Uh, I think that instead of saying repairing the nasal perforation, you have to think is it's always, or you have to always try to uh, give health and uh, try to remove the complaints of the patient and give a better quality of life to that patient. For example, I have some uh, lateral nasal flap patient that I did the surgery, everything goes good. 
uh, if you see endoscopically, it's a disaster. It's really, it's really ugly. You have tiny perforation everywhere, but the patient is symptom free. So, okay, the patient is happy. I'm happy. Of course, if you see the endoscope, I'm not happy. But uh, the idea is to, to improve the quality of life, not to have a nice endoscopic view. So for me, it's, yeah. at least for me, is how I, I approach this. Yeah, the, the, it's basically some, some patients complaining like empty nose syndrome, some, some others not. So exactly. why do we have to treat such patients? They might cause, in, we might cause an injury because some of the yeah. patients, as you yeah. said, they had previous surgeries sometimes when we are dealing with previous surgery vascularization is not allowed or not completely um you know health and those patients cannot be you know um, receptors for those kind of surgery another exactly. question for this this uh, colleagues is uh, hiding the the names from this is uh, from mexico and he say do you pack the nose no we don't, we just put the splints and we don't pack the nose. Yeah, so um, another, uh, another question uh, is, uh, um, it's, do you put preoperative antibiotics in such patients? Uh, yes, yes, we, we, as a rule, we mainly all patient of nasal surgery has uh, one gram of augmenting one hour before surgery. I don't have evidence if this helps or not, but we do it like this. This is our protocol. Okay. Mustafa from Saudi Arabia asking, uh, do you remove the sutures after when? No, uh, we do not remove the sutures. Uh, the first cases of pericranial flap, we use proline. As you know, it's, uh, it does not... Uh, reabsorb and we don't have any problems nowadays i i am using pds for all the sutures in nasal perforation but you can use bicryl if you're doing this running knot and you want to use bicryl you have to use vaseline because if not it won't it won't run all right there's a question from Sergei Gorbunov. He say, "Do you have case of front case of frontitis after that procedure?" Sergey, what's the meaning of frontitis? I I don't get it. So, frontal sinusitis. I guess I don't know what was. If you can please type again, we can we can use it. So we let's skip and go to the other question. Alberto once again he said, "Do you use CFD modeling tools to know what is the real problem when a patient also complained on empty nose syndrome?" Um, oh, yes, so um, nowadays I'm working with uh, the guys from the Barcelona Supercomputing here. We are modeling a nasal perforation. We are seeing that um, those patients that have that are asymptomatic, the complete the CTF of those patients is completely different to the, to the CTF of patients with symptoms. So, but we are working on that. Hopefully we'll have results in six months, one year, and you, you will see the paper. It's pretty interesting. Great, great. So Sergey comes with the a, with a right uh, question. It's a frontal sinusitis. It has been replied before. Yes. So no. No. <laughs> and um, let's it's, go it, ahead. And it's more, it's in one case of this procedure, uh, the patient have, haven't had a frontal sinus, so we have to create a frontal sinus in order to pass, and we don't have any problems. All right, so last question, then we, we are out of time. For other questions, please do remind that uh, Cristobal provided his email. You can watch again the whole, um, um, the whole episode on our YouTube channel for anything that you can get back to him. Gustavo is about to say, can the pericranial flap be used to repair defects of the lateral nasal wall? Yes, but like what? <laughs> um, I think that, Gustavo, you have to understand that what kind of lateral nasal wall would like to reconstruct if we do have to you know, put the air inside of the maxillary sinus. Yeah. So Sometimes I'm, I, I use the pericranial flap as a lining. If, 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 if it's meaning like that when you have to reconstruct the nose and you have, you put the, the flap as lining. But 
no, not not easy in this case, I guess. So no. we the two weeks ago we described our technique for repairing a skull based procedure based on a septal flip flap, which was based on an anterior ethmoidal arteries. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the keystone area for raising those flaps uh, based on those supply. And as and, and as Cristobal said, there's uh, you can go and get that book made from uh, um, somebody the end of Maestro Castelnuovo regarding these uh, techniques. Uh, you can get that and everything's on it. Thank you so much, Cristobal, for the brilliant presentation. I really, really helped me a lot with the suture. That was a great book. <laughs> and I think that everyone uh, and everyone does it. So uh, many thanks. Uh, all the audience is uh, very satisfied. Do remind, oh, oh that's that's fascinating. Uh, it's it's in, in Arabic. I cannot read the name. I hope you don't mind. Do you put a drain at the pericranial? In, in, the, in the skull, yes. Yes, we put one, just one. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, Jackson Pratt, a tiny one that for one day and that's it. Okay, great. That 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 was mandatory. Thank you so much. Let me try to say the name. I don't know. Thank you anyway. Thank you, Chris, <laughs> for your presentation. You're but, welcome, Puya. Yeah. Yes. Uh, please uh, do remind that the Barcelona team does a lot of dissection courses. Not for now, but in the future. If anyone interested, we do recommend always. Uh, international or uh, dissection courses mandatory for educational training though they are doing beautiful dissection courses please do uh, be aware of them and participate in them for those interested this can be viewed on our youtube channel from after the ending of this one do remind for tomorrow's appointment we do have another um, guest speaker who's going to talk on how to handle their septal perforation because it's a teamwork from uh, my my friend uh, Georgi Pollet from St. Petersburg. Thank you, Cristobal. Bring my cheers okay. to the Thank you, Puya. Thank you so much. Be thank safe you. and uh, you thank too. you for the attendance. I see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Bye bye.